Well, since we're talking about anniversaries, David and I just celebrated 50 years two weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> and my mom and daddy, who are members of the same church that Ron and Jean Simpson are in, have been married for 77 years. <laughs> so what a wonderful day to celebrate, right? The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Psalms 126, verse 3. The words of this song were written by Fanny Jane Crosby. A wonderful song, To God Be the Glory. And that's what we want to do this morning, give glory to God. If you want to stand, you can, but you don't have to. My favorite camp choruses was Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Now, there's a whole hymn, but we're just going to be singing that chorus today. Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Please. 
morning. You may be seated. I'm not one to uh, say much Greek or talk about Greek, uh, but there is a word, there is a Greek word that came to my mind as I was listening to us sing and to share together uh, and to enjoy our relationship uh, together, and that is the Greek word koinonia, koinonia. Koinonia is a word in Greek that means uh, unity, fellowship, sharing, uh, and even partnership. It's used, uh, it's used for partnership in, in the gospel. And, uh, you know, as I looked at everyone today, you know, I, I thought of the, of the fellowship that we share together in the Lord. And, uh, and I guess I'd say how blessed, how blessed that is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you this day. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior, and his sacrifice that has removed the barrier of sin so that we can have fellowship with you. And as we have fellowship with you, we have fellowship with one another, and we join in, uh, in your love and in the sweetness of your Spirit. And even, I guess I would say, reflecting on what Dr. Smith has said this week, as we in some measure experience even here the heavenlies. And we just pray that you would be with us as we continue to share together, and especially now as we look at your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning to you. You all look all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed this morning. I think I just called you a bunch of squirrels. <laughs> if it fits. <laughs> People ask me about what my role is as president. Sometimes I think it's like herding squirrels, gathering squirrels. So. <laughs> Well, we're on page 17 of uh, our study guide. If you're following along with us, we'll start there. Session three, we have been strengthened, united, and renewed. Strengthened, united, and re renewed. And we come to the third prayer in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Uh, good, good teaching, good doctrine, good theology must always lead to worship. If it doesn't lead us to worship, it's not good theology. Uh, because the purpose of theology, words about God, is to lead us to a relationship with God. So it shouldn't surprise us that in this first section of the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters where Paul is explaining to us the redemptive work of God in Christ that we come to know and experience through the Holy Spirit. He wants us to understand that redemptive work, good theology, that uh, in that section, these first three chapters, he breaks out into prayer three times. Uh, we saw in chapter one, uh, the, the prayer of praise, the prayer of blessing of God, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Uh, and then he follows the prayer of praise with a prayer of illumination, uh, that the spirit would open the eyes of our hearts, give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation that we may know, we may understand the great work. And he goes on to describe that great work in the rest of chapter 2 uh, and in parts of chapter 3. We looked at some of those passages last night. And then he ends that section with another prayer. And in this case, it is a prayer for spiritual strength. It's a prayer for spiritual strength. So let's begin by reading the passage, Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, 
that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now there's our reference to the Holy Spirit. That you may be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that, there's, there's a that uh, here again, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. What's the power at work within us? It's the Holy Spirit. There's another reference for us. According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is a prayer for spiritual strength. He starts by saying, for this reason. We sometimes read right over top of those little connecting phrases, especially in Paul. But that's really important. We should stop and ask, for what reason? (laughs) For this reason. The reason is, remember the context. The reconciling work of God in Christ. He wants us to understand that. And then as we understand it, we also need to recognize that God's purpose in Christ leads to our purpose of making that known, that mystery that we all, that was hidden for so long that now has been made known to us, we now are responsible. We, we are those that, that communicate the mystery, the gospel to, to, to others. We are called to, to make known the manifold, the many colored nature of God's grace to others. It is a tremendous responsibility that requires our best efforts. And so immediately... We think, hmm, I'm, I don't know if I can do that or not. For this reason, what do I need? What I need is spiritual strength. I'm inadequate to the task of communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ effectively. Even the, even the apostle Paul recognized that he was the least of all the saints when it came to ministry. That he could only fulfill his ministry through grace. It's so easy to lose heart because we get discouraged. We fall short. We fail to fulfill the calling of God on our lives as individuals and as congregations. We need power. We need spiritual strength. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 4, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Treasure is the gospel. The jars of clay is our frail human weakness. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. And then you may remember in 2 Corinthians 12, when he's talking about his own thorn in the flesh, which we don't really know what that was. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. I'll even boast about my weaknesses so that the power of God may dwell in me. For this reason, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is devoted to making the presence and power of the risen Christ real to those whom he indwells. Now I'm going to say that again because that's important. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is devoted to making the presence and power of the risen Christ real to those whom he indwells. And so we've seen already the Spirit as a Spirit of wisdom. The Spirit as our teacher. The Spirit who leads to knowledge and understanding. Now we have a little bit of a shift and we see the Spirit as a Spirit of power. A a, a Spirit of spiritual strength. A Spirit that enables us. He is teacher as the Spirit of wisdom. He is the worker as the spirit of power. Gordon Fee calls this the empowering presence of God in our lives. The empowering presence of God. 
the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit strengthens us with power. The, the word power that Paul uses here is the word dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. <laughs> uh, it's dynamite, spiritual power. I like some of the other translations. J.B. Phillips translates this as the Spirit's inner reinforcement. We're fortified, we're braced, we're invigorated. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, if the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, if the Spirit dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Think of the Holy Spirit as the inner power pack, spiritually, that from which we draw our strength to live a life worthy of the calling that we have in Christ. Now, Paul goes on in this prayer to tell us what the power of the Holy Spirit enables us to do. He gets down to very practical terms uh, here. To be under the control of the Spirit, to have the Spirit strengthening us in our inner person, here's what the Spirit does for us. First of all, he prays that there's four things. And first of all, he prays that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. The Spirit enables the, uh, the, that Christ will dwell in our hearts by faith. That word dwell there means to settle down, to take up residence, to be at home. This isn't just an occasional visit. You know, this isn't the neighbor running over to borrow a cup of sugar. This is settling in. This is putting your feet up on the furniture uh, and, and controlling the remote. Uh, you know, this, this is settling in, settling, that Christ may settle down in your hearts. That means that we are under the control of the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite devotional books is by Robert Boyd Munger, and it's entitled My Heart, Christ Home. And if you've ever read that, it's a beautiful depiction. He depicts our soul as, as a house with many rooms. And he and Jesus just walk through the rooms. Uh, and, and he reflects on Jesus' control over all areas of his life. It's inviting Jesus to be at home in our lives. Jesus said a lot about abiding. That's a good old word we don't say enough in church anymore. Abiding. I love that old hymn, abide with me, fast falls the even tide. Abide with me. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, it'll be done. By this, my father is glorified. He says, if you keep my commandments, you abide in my love just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. The Spirit enables Christ to settle down and be at home in our lives, to control, to be Lord over everything that we do. Secondly, the Spirit gives us power to understand that we are rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. This is one of my wife's favorite expressions because she's... Uh, she not only has two green thumbs, she's got green fingers and hands and toes and everything else. She can just about walk by something and it grows. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't get that. I walk by something and it dies. Uh, but uh, this, is a, th th this is an illustration from the plant world. The root system of a plant does two things. One is it provides st stability and strength to the plant. Uh, if, if, that, if that plant's drooping over, it's probably, not the, it's, it's probably not what's going on above the ground. It's what's going on below the ground. It's the root system that brings stability to a plant. And then the root system brings nourishment to the plant. That's how the plant gets all the nutrients that it needs to, to, to thrive. The Spirit helps us to root and ground our lives where? In Christ's love. And the better we understand Christ's love, the more spiritual strength we have. When we realize just how much God loves us, where do we draw our stability? Where do we draw our nourishment? It's from the love of God that's in Christ. That's the source. And the Spirit communicates God's love 
to our hearts. And then thirdly, he does that so that we will be able to comprehend the love of Christ, the height, depth, length, breadth of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Now we're back to a spirit of revelation that you may comprehend. Literally means get a hold of. Young people today say, wrap my head around <laughs> this. It, it helps me to conceive of, of the, the surpassing love of Christ, the unbelievable grace and mercy and love of God. There, there's an interesting sort of paradox in, this, uh, in these verses. Paul says that we want you to have the strength to comprehend the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. See the problem there? <laughs> how, am I, how in the world am I going to comprehend something that surpasses knowledge? <laughs> well, he's really here not talking about uh, not the knowledge that is beyond comprehension. He's talking about the vastness of the love of Christ that's beyond comprehension. It's not that we can't understand many things about the love of Christ. It's just that we will never understand the fullness of the love of Christ. In, in, my, in my former professor life, uh, I was a historian. I, I, I still, I guess I still am uh, a historian uh, and uh, taught uh, the church history course here for many, uh, many years. And there are days I'd love to take my piece of chalk and go back in the classroom. Uh, uh, but uh, um, I taught the church, uh, church history. Uh, and when I was doing my uh, uh, church history degree, the very first class I took in church history was a, a course in Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, now, I, I, I'm just a country mountain holler boy from way up in East Tennessee. You'd be probably scared to go in the holler that I grew up in. Uh, and, 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 and to learn about the Eastern Orthodox Church, it was like I had stepped on another planet uh, to, to hear some of those ideas. But they had an idea that just captivated me that has always stuck with me. What, what is the purpose of eternity? The Eastern Orthodox theologians say that the purpose of, of eternity is to know the love of God. To know the, the reason we are eternally with God, eternal life, is so that we can learn to, to know the love of God and, and then, of course, express our love to God. How long does it take to know the love of God? It takes an eternity. That's how high it is, how wide it is, how deep, how broad. It's so vast. That love is so incomprehensible that it will take not just a lifetime to understand the love of God. It's going to take an eternity to know the love of God. The Spirit helps us to understand that. And then he ends up by saying, so that you will be filled with all the fullness of of God. And so we're back to this theme of fullness again. In chapter 1, verse 23, Paul said, The fullness of him who fills all in all. In chapter 3, verse 19, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. In chapter 4, verse 10, that he might fill all things. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ in 4:13. And then he comes in 5:18 to say, now you be filled with the Spirit. That theme of fullness for Him, in Him, in Jesus. Paul says in Colossians 2, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in Him. The Spirit fills us up as Christ dwells in our heart, as Christ is rooted and grounded in His love, as we are able to comprehend the love of Christ. One of my favorite cartoons is an old, old far side cartoon. And it's of a classroom. You've got a rows of desks and there's students there and the, the teacher's in front and he's sort of riding on the board. And there's a kid on the front row with his hand raised and he says, Mr. Osborne, may I be excused? My brain is full. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I read... <laughs> When I read about the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of the love of God 
and, and being rooted and grounded in that love and being able to comprehend in some way that love, that Christ who loves me so deeply dwells in my heart by faith, my brain's full. <laughs> my brain's full. Uh, it's hard to comprehend. The Christian life is a life of a filling of God, constant growth, constant maturity, from incompleteness to completeness, from brokenness to wholeness, from weakness to strength. I may be fading on the outside, but I'm flourishing on the inside. Uh, I think Steve had it, didn't he? Uh, he understood. And that's what Paul is saying here. Now the Lord is the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And we with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. As the Spirit transforms us into being filled with all the fullness of God. Paul prays, you may have the strength to know and understand and experience that. And then he concludes with this wonderful, wonderful doxology. Uh, how, how many of you, Ephesians 3, 20, 21, it's your favorite verse uh, in, in Scripture? A lot, lots of you. It's a great, great Scripture. Paul says in one of the most beautiful passages, Now to him who is able to do more than you could ask or think. Some, some translations say that you could ask or imagine. You can't even imagine uh, what all God can do. According to the power at work. There's the Spirit's work. According to the power at work. It's the power of the resurrection. It's the power of the, of the risen Christ. Enthroned in the heavenlies. And then raised and enthroned us with Him there. That power is at work in the Christian and is at work in the church. To God be the glory. Uh, in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Amen and amen. That's our power. Strengthened. Secondly, united. And we now transition to the second uh, half of the book of Ephesians. I've said... Uh, sometime in the past two days, uh, that you can divide Ephesians very clearly. The first three chapters are basically theological. Uh, Paul is just laying out the great plan of God, the great plan of salvation, and the great redemptive work in Christ Jesus, and how the Holy Spirit communicates that to us and empowers us to understand and experience it. So chapters 1, 2, 3 is theology. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 is how you live that out. It's practical. It's since this is true, here's how you ought to live. Since you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, here's how spiritual people live. And so the second half encourages us to live the kind of life that is, that, that is pleasing to God. And so Paul sort of shifts from these heavenly truths to everyday living. I'm going to go ahead and put this down before I knock it over. Uh, from belief to behavior, from doctrine to duty, from faith to action. Part one is the glorious vision, and part two is how you live that vision out. And a key word that you will notice in the scripture that we're going to read is the word walk. In the second half of the book of Ephesians, Paul uses the word walk five times. And he compares living out the Christian life as a walk. Now, that's a good biblical theme. You go in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, God often called his people to walk in his way. The Christian life is described uh, as, uh, as, a, uh, as a walk. Because I have experienced the undeserved grace of God in Christ, I want to walk in gratitude and humility and do everything I can do to serve the one who's loved me so deeply and completely. So let's read uh, chapter 4, begin with verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk, there it is, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, 
eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's, this, there's our reference to the Spirit. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit. There's the Spirit again. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There's the theme, theme of fullness again, by the way. Uh, now, Paul begins this, this explanation of how spiritual people ought to live. He begins it with the relationships with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And he is, in essence says, if you can't love those with whom you share faith in Jesus... How can you expect to love those outside of Christ? It's lots harder to love those outside of Christ than it is to love people who share eternity with you. If you can't love people in Christ, how can you ever minister to those outside of Christ? Anyone, John says, who says, I love God, hates his brother, is a liar. He who does not love his brother whom he cannot, whom, whom he he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Whoever loves God must always love his brother. The one spirit creates a unity of God's people. And it's evidenced by the presence of the spirit, people who understand who they are in Christ and understand the mission that they're called to in Christ. And see... Sin disconnects. Sin disintegrates. It divides. It breaks. It segregates. It isolates. It fractures. It destroys community. That's what sin does to us. The Holy Spirit connects. It unites. It integrates. It mends. It joins. It puts back together. It creates community. So Paul begins this, how do spiritual people live? Well, it starts with loving your brother and sister in Christ. That's where it starts. Be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Other translations say, spare no effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It is as God existed, continuous, diligent, active, keep on Keeping on. It's something that we're called to do. Maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now he then tells us the pathway, the way that we walk in order to do this. If you want to be a uniter rather than a divider, if you want to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, you got to become a certain kind of person. He says, with all humility. I like the King James here. Lowliness of mind. Lowliness of mind. Paul said in Romans 12, I say to everyone, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Lowliness of mind. Gentleness. Again, the old word here is meekness. Now, I said meekness, not weakness. I'm not talking about being weak. Meekness doesn't mean... Meekness or gentleness is really power under control. It's the word that was used to describe a domesticated animal. Uh, that big old ox <laughs> is under the yoke. And it can do useful work because of that. It is meek. It is, it is gentle. Jesus was described in Matthew 11 as gentle and lowly. There's humility Lowliness and gentleness. Patience. Again, I like the old King James here. Long suffering. Long suffering. Sometimes you just got to do it. You suffer long. Literally, patience can mean long tempered, which means your temper better have a long, long fuse <laughs> that can be stomped out pretty quickly uh, as, uh, as needed. Patience. Forbearance. Forbearance simply means to put up with. 
It's an essential quality for husbands and wives. You learn to just put up with. But, but it's not just putting up with. It's putting up with in light of a higher goal or purpose. And it has to do with extending grace to others. That before we criticize, before we judge, we seek to understand in grace who that person is and what that person is going through. Forbearance. And then love. Above all, put on love. John 3, Jesus said that by this people will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So how, how do we maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace? We become certain kinds of people through the power of the Holy Spirit. People of humility and gentleness and patience and forbearance and love. Hum, what does that sound like to you? What does that sound like to you? Sounds like the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't it? And that's exactly what you have. This is another list of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Here's another list. Humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, love. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the character that the Spirit produces within our lives when He indwells us, when we are under His control. And then Paul goes on to lay the foundation of that unity. Now, you've got to be careful here. When he comes to these, all of these ones, there's seven ones, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. Well, we, we think of this passage as a doctrinal passage. Now, now certainly it has doctrinal implications, and, and you can teach doctrinal truths out of this passage. But the purpose of this is not doctrinal. The purpose is relational. Since you share the one body and the one spirit and the one hope, the one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, you should be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. That's the foundation. Because you share all of these things together, therefore you should love each other deeply as brothers and sisters in Christ. What unites us in Christ is so much more important than what divides us. We need to learn that in the church. What unites us in Christ is so much more important than the things that divide us. Worship style preaching style, whether the lights are on or the lights are off, whether you got smoke or you don't have smoke in your worship service, whether the boys wear their baseball caps to play the drums or not, all of those things pale in comparison to what unites us in Christ. All those little things that divide us. And there's nothing wrong with talking about and debating, trying to find wisdom on all of those. There's nothing wrong with that. But you've got to remember first and foremost that it is that foundational unity that's in Christ that governs our relationships and what unites us in Christ is so, so, so much more important than all those little things that divide us. We need that attitude if we're going to make every effort to, to, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so the question here, certainly what I believe is important and, and anything, anything unity built on anything other than biblical truth is a shaky foundation. But, but the real test of the reality of our belief is not what do I believe, but how do I behave? How does that belief manifest itself in my behavior? It comes down to what kind of person am I? Am I a person that the Spirit can produce that fruit. That's why we, have to be, we must be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Well, we're to the last scripture of today. That's chapter 4, verse 17. <laughs> I knew I'd forgot to say something. You, you would think I've said enough. Uh, 
I, I should have said this earlier. Uh, I was, uh, I, when I was in the preaching ministry full time, uh, I generally preached in series. Uh, uh, I, I get onto a passage or a topic and I can't get off of it. I just stay with it uh, and keep digging until I run out of dirt. Uh, and uh, uh, so I decided, I, I was a church I was ministering to in Upper East Tennessee, and I decided I was going to preach four sermons from Ephesians 4. Doesn't it have a nice catchy tune uh, to it, a catchy way? Uh, and I was going to put that on a church sign, you know, four sermons from Ephesians 4. Uh, and so I got started on those four sermons from Ephesians 4. And I couldn't get out of Ephesians 4. And I ended up preaching 22 sermons <laughs> from Ephesians chapter 4. I was down to preaching sermons on one word, uh, you know, in, in the passage. And so when, when we left that church, when I transitioned from the ministry of the church, they were, they were give, the church was giving us a little going, going away party, and they were giving us presents. And, and, uh, and a lot of them were sort of gag gifts, you know, that uh, we were having fun with. And so somebody had gone to the uh, thrift store and had purchased an unabridged dictionary. It was one of those dictionaries that was about that thick, and they'd put a cover on it, a, a, a book cover on it, and it said, four sermons from Ephesians 4. <laughs> so, uh, so y'all don't have a chance. Y'all don't have a chance. I, I may never shut up uh, today as long as we're here in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4. Well, uh, we come now in chapter 4, verse 17 through 24, to the theme of our Bible study. This is where that phrase, renewed in the spirit of your minds, comes from. Uh, and uh, we're still talking about walking. You'll see that when we read the scripture. How do we live out the life? Uh, and central to living out the life is a constant renewal, a renewal of the spirit of our minds. So let's read again. Chapter 4, verse 17. Now, this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk. There's walking. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to hardness of heart. They've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. That's what those outside of Christ are like. But that's not how you learn Christ. Assuming you've heard about him, we're taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. There's our phrase, be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul says, now let's think about what's happened to you in Christ. You were once like this, but now that you have learned Christ, you were taught in him, you have heard about him. I, I call this passage the Karate Kid. It's a Karate Kid passage. You remember that movie, Karate Kid, and Mr. Miyagi taught uh, the, 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 hit the young pupil, wax on, <laughs> wax off, <laughs> Wax on. Well, Paul says, put on, put off. Put off, put on. So this is a Karate Kid uh, passage. That the key to being renewed in the spirit of your minds is to recognize that there is an old self that you have to put off and a new self that you have to put on. It's like changing clothes. There's an old set of grave clothes that you've got to take off. And there's a new set of rebirthed clothes, reborn clothes that you have to put on. And it begins, it starts in the mind, how we think. Be renewed in the spirits of your mind. So the spirit is working in our mind. And he goes on to really describe two kinds of minds. Now he's using the term Gentiles here as a word for we might say pagans today. Those who are not of the Jewish covenant but uh, who are still outside of Christ. The old self, the Gentiles. And he says that they experience futility of mind. Futility means emptiness. Uh, it's the word from Ecclesiastes, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. It's useless. It's like chasing after the wind. Futility of mind. And in Christ, you have a renewed mind. That's the new self. 
So futility of mind as opposed to renewed mind. And then he describes really two processes. Uh, the, the first I'm going to call degeneration. This is the downward spiral of sin. And he describes what happens when we give ourselves over to sin. It starts with ignorance. See, it starts with the mind. It starts with ignorance, whether that be that's lack of knowledge, whether it be willful or unwillful, it's ignorance. Leads to hardness of heart, again, willful disobedience, refusal to repent. The consequence is that they're alienated from God beyond repentance, and then therefore they just give up to human sensuality. The carnal mind cares for only the flesh, and there's no shame, there's no fear of consequences, there's no concern of the impact on others, and so you become greedy, self-seeking, self-pleasing, self-centered, impure, unclean, with a loss of self-control. It's a downward spiral of sin and death. And hell, it starts with darkness of mind. And from the darkness of mind, it leads to deadness of soul. And then ultimately to a recklessness of life. I know some folks like that. In contrast, Paul says, the regenerative mind, the, the mind of rebirth and renewal, is an upward climb of righteousness and holiness. And it starts with the mind, what you have learned and heard and were taught, the truth in Jesus. And then you put off the old self and put on the new self and you're renewed in the spirit of your minds and you become like God in righteousness and true holiness. So the upward climb is you start with the enlightenment of the mind, the truth that is in Jesus that leads to the rebirth and resurrection of the soul and ultimately leads to a fruitful, God-honoring life. So we're called to be renewed, not the downward spiral of sin, but the upward climb of righteousness and holiness. Now we're back to this uh, lowercase s versus capital letter S in spirit. Uh, when he says be renewed in the spirit of your minds, is he talking about the human spirit or is he talking about God's spirit? Well, you know the key now, right? Is it human spirit or God's spirit? Yes. Yes, that's the answer. Uh, he's talking about the human spirit that is renewed by the spirit of God. Remember when Paul uses the term spirit, it always, unless there's some, there, there are some rare occasions where it's, it's specifically something else. But in most vast majority of cases, when, when Paul says spirit, it always ends up as the Holy Spirit. It is, it is the Holy Spirit that transforms and renews and regenerates our minds. Spiritual renewal is that innermost self, true self, the spiritual self that has been transformed by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. It's what we call that first night, the eyes of our heart being enlightened. Spiritual renewal is a really important theme in the New Testament. And the word that Paul uses here for renewed is the word neos that means, means literally to make young again. To make young again. In Christ, we are being made young again. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. You remember in John 3, Nicodemus said, what, good, what, what, what do I need to do? Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, what? <laughs> what in the world? Uh, uh, what does that mean, be born again? To be made young again. Got to be born of water and spirit. There's a regeneration, a rebirth that must take place. Everyone is born of the Spirit. That's why Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. In Romans 12, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And then the passage that Steve read last night. So we do not lose heart, though the outward, outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. 
For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. It is a constant being renewed. Now, now to, 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 to make this literal and vivid for us, uh, the, the, the verb tense that Paul uses in this statement is the present infinitive. So it really should be translated, keep on being renewed. Keep on being renewed in the Holy Spirit. It is a constant process. It's something that continues to happen uh, in our lives. We are, uh, we, we are constantly being made young again as we are renewed by the Spirit. We're always growing, never coasting, never arriving, best days ahead, not behind. I'm preaching Steve's sermon again. I'm sorry. We could even say his phrase again. Fading on the outside, but flourishing on the inside. That's that daily renewal. Paul says, be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Let's pray together. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and all God's people say it. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Um, my name is Larry Green, and I'm often confused uh, of being a professor here. I, I barely graduated. In fact, when I was first hired, I asked President Eubanks if he looked at my transcript, and he said, no, no, we looked at what you did after you got out of college. So I serve as special assistant to the president for generosity. And I have the opportunity this morning, very briefly, uh, to update you on the uh, Uncommon Community Capital Campaign. That campaign uh, was designed to raise $24,500,000. The goal of that was to be completed in February 2024. And that accomplished the building of the Graham Center which I hope you have visited, and the commons or cafeteria and cafe on the Florida campus prior to Johnson uh, assuming the responsibility of that campus, the students were cooking in their dorm rooms, in their apartments. Actually, they were going to Subway, Wawa, and all of those quick foods. So that became a priority on that campus. God blessed us. So one year early on February 2023, we had received 24,900,000. Okay, I have a better idea than applause. So I thought of uh, getting one of those confetti uh, shooter things. And then I thought, I I'll be the one cleaning it up. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing that. Number two, I thought of applause, which we just, we just, we just do all the time. And then I thought the best way to praise the Lord for what he's done in this campaign is the word amen. Amen is a word that comes from the Hebrew aman, which means certainty, truth, and verily. It is used to express agreement and affirmation of something that is said. And the believers said, amen. Well, how, how is this gold reached? 
I mean, this, this was a marvelous, this was the largest campaign that Johnson University uh, had, had ever taken. There were three ways. Uh, faithful, regular gifts. We have folks that uh, provide gifts to the college that give a monthly, bi-monthly, tri-monthly, uh, what's half, half monthly, half, half yearly, and then yearly. That was a critical part in the success of this campaign. And then we had some very, very generous gifts. All gifts are important, but there were some generous gifts that, that really moved the campaign along. And then we had some extremely large estate gifts. Now, Philip has a display uh, to the left uh, that would be helpful to you. And he, on Wednesday morning, uh, from nine, at 9.45 and 11 is doing a seminar on living trust. And that would be a, a great investment of your time to understand how a gift, that could be a gift to Johnson. The UCC, uh, since the campaign goal was reached, what, what's happening now? What, what, what is going on? The UCC continues to the original date uh, of February 2024. The continuation is due to the urgent need for current and new student scholarships. Donors provided scholarships for 617 students for the 22-23 year, uh, averaging 40. $4,843 and 71 cents. I don't, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know why the 71 cents is there, but that's how it worked out. Totaling, now this is Johnson Institutional Aid. This is not government. This is money that Johnson provided, dollars. I want to share a donor story with you. In 1970, uh, I was raising my support to work for CIY, uh, Christ in Youth. Maybe some of you know that. I was the fourth or fifth person hired. So I made a presentation at First Christian Church in Washington, Indiana. And a woman walked up to me and she said, I will provide $5 a month. That was actually what she was capable. And then she said, look at me. Now, I remember that from my mom. It's like, look at me. So I focused very quickly on her. She said, I I'm old. Now, this morning in the cafeteria, I made a mistake and I needed to apologize. I was helping a lady with a tray, and sh she said, well, I'm doing okay, I'm 90. And I go, oh, you don't look a bit over 80. And so, <laughs> I don't know where she is, but I'm sorry about that comment <laughs> there. She said, look at me, I'm old. I'm on Social Security, I walk with a cane, I don't get out much, and I just barely get to church to follow what President Smith said, to follow what Steve White said, what was said. She was fading on the outside and flourishing on the inside. She closed our conversation with these words. I can't do what you can do, but with my gift, I can do the work through you. And she just walked off. She was done. What she said has, has stuck in my heart and my mind through all the time I was CIY, through the time working at Christian Financial Resource, through my time here. That statement she made applies to the mission of Johnson University. Johnson University mission is to educate students for Christian ministries and other strategic vocations formed by the Great Commission in order to extend the kingdom of God among all nations. 
gifts for scholarships help recruit students and educate students. Thursday morning, the opportunity will be given to provide a gift for current, that's in that 2 million nine, and new student scholarships. Uh, there, there is a crisis in our country in families being able to pay for their schooling. The opportunity will be given Thursday morning to provide a gift for current and new student scholarships. Your gift helps with the solution to meet urgent scholarship need. Unless otherwise designated on your check, uh, that, that, that your gift will go to scholarships. If you prefer that that goes to the Florida campus, then in, in that line, Florida campus scholarships. And for you who do not carry a checkbook, I, I think there are people out there, we will have a, a credit card form uh, tomorrow morning, Thursday uh, morning for you. As you think about and pray about the investment in Johnson University, will you remember uh, Mrs. Martin? I can't do what you can do, but my gift, I can do the work through you. You can get the gift to the right people. We will do that. We thank the Lord for his guidance and blessings and his continued watch over of his family. And the believer said, amen. You know, one of the principles that we uh, see in uh, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 is uh, proportional giving, giving as the Lord blessed. And Larry just shared uh, this uh, story, this wonderful saint who uh, gave uh, sacrificially in, in terms of what she was able to give. And, uh, you know, that was not just a blessing to Larry. That was a blessing to her. You, you know, giving, being used of the Lord is a blessing to the giver as well as the receiver. And that, you know, I mentioned earlier, koinonia, partnership. That's, see, see, really, it's a three-pronged partnership. Partnership with God, because God is the one that makes it all possible, you know. And a partnership of the giver and a partnership of the receiver. And somebody might say, well, what? I say, okay, Philip, I get all that stuff. But really, I mean, really. What can $25 a month do? Well, there's another principle in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. And God will multiply the harvest of your righteousness. So who knows what the Lord can do? He can do a lot more than we can uh, ask or imagine. So we hope you take advantage of that, uh, that opportunity. Also, you can make a gift uh, to, um, uh, for the Florida campus. If you want to impact the Florida campus, just write on your check uh, or in a note included with it for the Florida campus. Uh, <clears throat> Larry mentioned the forms. Uh, uh, we'll, have, we'll have tons of them out tomorrow, but there are also some already at the table. One side is for a bank transfer. If you want to do a bank direct bank transfer, another one is for credit card. And it can be a one-time, or sometimes at Senior Saints, people like to set up a monthly contribution. Also, many of you are aware, but some of you may not be aware, that you actually can make a gift directly from your IRA if you are 70 and a half or older. And uh, there are some, uh, some tax advantages to that. So if you'd like to know more about how you can make that happen, there also is a handy-dandy form over there as well. Also, if you happen to work for or are retired from a major corporation, we really encourage you to investigate the possibility that that company may match your gift. Uh, Exxon matches three for one. If you, uh, you retired from Exxon, I really want to talk to you today. Um, <clears throat> but uh, many companies uh, match one for one, so we uh, really appreciate you uh, taking advantage of that opportunity. 
Okay, a uh, few other announcements. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a great program with Family Feud. Uh, there will be a pre-show at 645 uh, featuring uh, a, a duo called Blackberry Banshee, and uh, they're also going to play during the program. But uh, if you want to enjoy a little bit more extra music, a little bit more extra, that's redundant, a little bit extra music, uh, then come at 645 and uh, enjoy and participate in that. Also, we, we are going to eat supper in Golly Commons tonight, so you will not be packing your lunch. So but we do invite you to stagger so we don't have a big, long line. And I guess since Red has been eating, eats, eats first on Tuesday and Thursday, let's let Green in general eat first today. So that'll sort of help us stagger. Now, if, you've, if you're red and you've got to eat first, then uh, green has been eating first? Wow, I need to learn to read my program. Okay, well, if green has been eating first, let's let red eat first. Okay. Okay. I stand corrected. <clears throat> keep Y'all keep me straight. Um, there are a couple of different workshops, uh, variations, so be sure and check uh, page 24 and 25. I think I have that right. Uh, oh, there are four more tickets, just four tickets for you to, uh, to tour the home that I grew up in. No, that, that's not why it's important. For the, uh, the Sears and Roebuck house, there's, there's four tickets yet available. It is the house, if, if you're facing the doors that you go into Golly Commons, it's the house to the left with the, with the big porch in front of it. So that's how you, you know that. And with the finely manicured lawn, the unbelievable landscaping, that's the house. They, they, we live across the street from them. They make us look terrible. So anyway, that's the way it goes. By the way, if you look at my yard, I texted my son this morning, it would be helpful if you mowed the yard today. So <laughs> we'll see if that happens. All right, let's stand and be dismissed. We're, we're overachieving. Dr. Smith ended early, and so uh, we have a little extra time uh, to, uh, to relax on the veranda with a cup of coffee or water. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious day that we are enjoying in the Lord, and we pray that you would be with us as we learn and fellowship more and enjoy your creation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.